So venture spleen. The spleen is an organ with both immune and circulatory functions. It's located in the upper left quadrant of the diaphragm and it acts as a blood bank by absorbing excess volume and releasing stores during increased oxygen demands. So if there's excess volume, the spleen will hold on to the blood. But if there's a need, if there's a decreased, if there's decreased oxygen availability, the spleen will release blood into circulation. So the spleen plays a very important role in regulating blood hematocrit. And blood hematocrit, which is an integral part of our complete blood count along with hemoglobin concentration, white blood cells and platelets. In humans, the spleen contains between 200 to 250 mil of densely packed blood cells or an estimated 8% of our total red blood cell count. So hematocrit is the percentage of blood comprised of red blood cells which in turn deliver oxygen to the body tissues via the circulatory system. It's normally about 45% for males and 40% for females. And oftentimes hematocrit is tested to determine if athletes are involved in blood doping, if their hematocrit levels are above what they should be. But in general, an athlete will have higher hematocrit because when they're ex exercising intensively, their oxygen saturations are going to drop and their spleen will release more red blood cells into circulation. So they will tend to have higher hematocrit. But individuals who are doing the steps will also show higher hematocrit. And I've had a couple of emails from people who are not athletes and they come back and they do a VO2 max and it shows that their hematocrit levels are quite high. And the, the tester is asking, you must be an elite athlete. Your hematocrit levels are high. And they weren't doing physical exercise, but they were doing the steps. So it was generating the same effect. Repetitive breath holds induces splenic contraction in humans, coinciding with hemoglobin and hematocrit concentration. So when you hold your breath, your oxygen levels are dropping, and of course the spleen is going to release red blood cells into circulation. And, and this paper here, it's, it's a Croatian study. They looked at five maximum breath holds with face immersed in cold water. Now, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's in air or face immersed. It's producing similar results. So these were five maximum breath holds with a rest of two minutes between each. And they were taken, a person would have a big breath in, a big breath, no, a big breath in, breath out, and a normal breath in, and then they held. So it's a little bit different from what we do. So they found that the spleen size decreased by 20%. Rapid spleen contraction and its slow recovery may contribute to the prolongation of successive briefly repeated apnea attempts. So the more you do it, the longer your breath hold time. And of course, this effect is happening. And Shagate, Erika Shagate, she's a professor of physiology as far as I'm aware. It may be animal physiology, but she became very involved in looking at breath hold time. She was aware that the normal physiological length of time for a human to hold her breath was about four to five minutes. And she was traveling ancient tribes and she noticed that some of the tribes were able to hold her breath for a lot longer than four or five minutes. So from that then she started looking at the research, how, what's the research between breath holding and humans. So in this study here, she looks at 20 volunteers including 10 who had their spleens removed. And she found an increase of hematocrit and hemoglobin by 6.4% and 3.3% respectively, following five maximum duration apneas with the face immersed under water. And furthermore, the breath hold times improved. So the breath holding again were showing spleen contraction. And to increase hematocrit by 6.4%, that's <coughs> significant and hemoglobin by 3.3%. The difference in top athletes is 0.5 of a percent. 0.5 of a percent. The margin between one top athlete and another is minimal. And athletes are looking for anything that's going to give them the edge. And that's why, of course, they've taken risks in the past, such as EPO and doping and everything else. But this is showing them how to do it naturally. 
And the beauty about this is that we're looking at it from every aspect. We're looking at it from the point of view of your everyday breathing. We're looking at it from the point of view of carbon dioxide. We're looking at it from the point of view of spleen contraction and EPO. So there's four effects. The hematological changes did not occur in individuals who had their spleens removed. So according to Chagate, suggests that splenic contraction occurs in humans as part of the diving response. So when we dive, the body makes certain adaptations, and one that you will have come across is called bradycardia. And basically, when you hold your breath, your body senses that there's a drop of oxygen. So what it wants to do is it wants to conserve blood for the heart and for the brain. So it will often shut down, it will slow down the heart rate, but it will shut down the peripheral circulation. So you might find that some of your clients are doing steps and the next thing is they have cold hands. And it's the opposite effect that usually that you expect because usually you're doing the reduced breathing and you feel, yeah, it's wonderful. Everybody's feeling warm, that's wonderful. We have vasodilation. And they go and do the steps and the opposite is happening. And now if they felt a chill all over, it could be a sign that their blood sugar levels are dropping. So you have to ask them, are they sensitive to... to changes in blood sugar levels, type 1 diabetes. But many people will experience cold hands, so that's part of the diving response. So the spleen contraction is also the diving response. Um, in this paper here, three maximum breath holes separated by two minutes of rest elicited spleen contraction in all 10 subjects, resulting in an increase of hematocrit and hemoglobin by 2.2 and 2.4% respectively. And I looked at a, a PhD that was written by um, a Swedish man. It seems that a lot of this research is all coming from Sweden. And his name is Matt Richardson. And he compared the effect of hypercapnia and hypocapnia in breath hold. Now you understand that when we do a breath hold, it's on the exhalation. So there's going to be a stronger hypercapnic response because CO2 is going to build up. And because there's not as much residual air left in the lungs, the carbon dioxide buildup is stronger. So it will have a hypercapnic response. So he compared the three. Eight non-divers performed three sets of apneas on three separate days under different conditions, one with pre-breathing CO2. So that was to generate the hypercapnic response, what we do. One with pre-breathing of 100% oxygen, which was normal and one with hyperventilation to get rid of the carbon dioxide, which was hypocapnic. But after the three apneas, the increase in hemoglobin in the hypercapnic trial was 9.1% greater than in the normal capnic trial and 71.1% greater than in the hypocapnic trial. So the steps and the way we're doing them is showing a stronger response than if you take a breath in and you hold. So it's, it's really in favor. You don't have to change your exercise. You can just continue doing what you're doing. Now, from a health point of view, those people with chronic fatigue, you can understand now how their fatigue can lift from doing the maximum breath holds because you're able to improve oxygen carrying capacity. Other people with anemia, with low hemoglobin, have them do the steps and push them through it. Of course, you, know, you have to be careful too, but push them through it. And you will experience it too. You do a series of steps, you might feel a little bit fatigued, and you do some steps, and the next thing is you feel quite alert afterwards. So it's not just the carbon dioxide response we're dealing with, it's also the oxygen response. So Richardson, he concluded that an increased capnic stimulus during apnea, it elicits a stronger spleen response. So the spleen releases even more red blood cells into circulation from the hypercapnic response and subsequent hemoglobin than apnea is preceded by hyperventilation. <laughs>